messages with the subject of the Lordship Church. We, the, the Lordship Church has been called the unregistered church, the unincorporated church, the free church. We refer to it as the Lordship Church because there is an attitude, a perspective that we like to have, and that is what we're trying to accomplish with the church is not to is not to disengage it from something. We're trying to engage it with something. We're trying to turn the church into what God wants it to be. And in that sense, we refer to the Lordship Church as opposed to just the unincorporated church. A lot of folks, I think, in our day look at the unincorporated church as a, a separation from government. We look at the Lordship Church as getting the church back to where God wanted it to be. And whatever that means, that's what we have to do. We're going to look this morning at the historical and legal perspective on the incorporated church. And then this, uh, this evening, we'll be looking at a biblical legal perspective on the, on the incorporated church. And then tomorrow morning, Lord willing, we'll be talking about uh, four pictures and challenges that God has presented of the, of the Lordship Church. and get a chance to see what the Bible says about the Lordship Church and the challenges that we face in the day in which we live. But this, but this morning, we want to deal with the historical and legal perspective. A short timeline of church incorporation, because I think there is a lot of misunderstanding as to where the thing came from. Back in 1327, Edward III of England chartered ecclesiastical corporations for charitable purposes. Interestingly enough, we still only charter ecclesiastical corporations for charitable purposes. And uh, that's one of the problems with being incorporated <coughs> as we go along. You have to become something other than a church to do that. In 1596, corporate legislation was passed in England, which created the corporate person, defined the powers, the capabilities, and the liabilities of the ecclesiastical corporation. In 1778, the Constitution of South Carolina, that should be an A at the end, South Carolina perhaps, but uh, assured freedom of incorporation for all Christian Protestant churches. And so as early as 1778 in our country, we had incorporation of churches. 1784 to 1798, incorporation acts were passed in New York and New Jersey and Delaware and Pennsylvania and even in the Northwest Territory. So incorporation of churches is a long-standing situation here in the United States. Some interesting voices from history. Isaac Backus, who was a pastor, a Baptist pastor, as it turned out, in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts, was a part of the Warren Association there, fought the whole concept of incorporation and entanglement for all of his years. And uh, after Bacchus was gone, the Warren Incorporation abandoned much of Bacchus' principles. While he was there, it was a different story. They had certificates there which were basically like tax exemptions. All right? One of the problems that we face a lot of times is people say, well, you know, I had, a, uh, I had a situation years ago in Lansing, Michigan, where they had a big where they had a big meeting up there, and uh, 2,000 people showed up on the lawn of the Capitol because they were, they were opposing uh, the state's requirements that uh, Christian schools do certain things. And so we went to that meeting, took a group of people from a church I was pastoring in Indiana at the time. We got there, and the first thing I heard, the speaker was up there talking about how we're going to go in, we're going to demand that they exempt us, and da-da-da-da-da. And uh, so I took my group and left. Uh, some years later, we had a uh, we had a fellow named Bill Green down in uh, uh, St. Uh, Saint Petersburg, Florida, and uh, he had a church in his house. And the state came in and said, "No, you can't have a church in your house." And uh, so we got involved in that with the law center. Got a, a phone call from Jay Sekolo and his organization, saying, "You know, we're fighting the same thing down here in in uh, in Florida." And we're trying to raise a half a million dollars to go to the legislature and demand that they exempt these churches and so forth. And uh, we'd like you folks in your case to join us. And I said, I'm not interested in joining. And the lady said, well, what do you mean you're not interested? I said, I don't agree with what you're doing. She said, how can you not agree? Well, it's a simple matter. You see, this whole thing of the filing of certificates, which was asking for an exemption, the back has hit it right on the head. He said this, it implied that the state had the right to legislate concerning religion. Right. Bacchus claimed that every act to exempt Baptists from religious taxes 
was so framed that they had to acknowledge such power if they were to be exempted, and such an implicit assent to the power of the state would wrong his conscience as much as to pray to the Virgin Mary. To request an exemption from the state, we first have to acknowledge the fact that the state has the power we're asking them to exempt us from. Therefore, we have to go to the state and say, yes, we acknowledge the fact that you have a right to tax our churches. What we're asking you to do is to allow us not to pay the taxes, so we are submitting not only to their jurisdiction, we are submitting actually to the concept that they have the right and authority to tax God's property in the first place. Now, here's another problem, by the way. Once you do that, then we've got these situations where people come along and they say, oh, wait a minute, you know, here's the problem. Uh, we, we had this exemption, now they took the exemption away from us, and now we're going to go out and we're going to object. We're going to stand up and say, you can't do this. Certainly they can. If you acknowledge their authority to tax the property when you ask for the exemption, you acknowledge their authority to tax it if they decide not to give you the exemption. Right? So, Bacchus hit the, hit the nail right on the head. He said, we're acknowledging their authority. He spoke vigorously for resolution. This is in the Warren Association back when, back when Isaac Bacchus was alive against incorporation. Bacchus won the day and the association resolved, quote, that it be earnestly commended to the churches belonging to the association by no means to apply to the or to apply to civil government for incorporation because we cannot consent to blend the kingdom of Christ with the kingdoms of this world. Notice the word blend, which I think was excellent there. James Madison was asked when he was president to uh, approve the incorporation of the Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. Uh, under, the, under the tutelage of John Leland, a Baptist pastor from Virginia at the time, Madison vetoed the incorporation request of the Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C., <clears throat> saying this, because the bill exceeds the rightful authority to which governments are limited by the essential distinction between civil and religious functions and violates in particular the article of the Constitution which declares that Congress shall make no law respecting a religious establishment. This particular church, therefore, would, be, would so far be a religious establishment by law. Madison said, if you incorporate a church, it becomes a religious establishment. It becomes essentially a state church. That's the reason why in the state of Virginia you could not incorporate a church until 2003, and I'll get to that before, before this session is over. However, the point being that incorporation is a religious establishment, is creation of a state-authorized, state-created state-ordained, state-supported church. How else do you define a state church? The Baptist in 1791 argued, quote, the holy author of our religion needs no compulsive measures for the promotion of his cause that the gospel wants not the feeble arm of man for its support. Amen. Now it's interesting in our day, and we'll talk about this perhaps in a little while, it is interesting in our day that 80% of the churches that the Law Center deals with on the subject of unincorporating their church and becoming a lordship church, we get amens and hallelujahs till we get to the tax-deductible gift. 80% <laughs> of the churches who do not follow through and unincorporate, we lose at the tax-deductible gift because they are determined that the church wants the feeble arm of man for its support. Senator Sumner in 1872 said, We have no right to enter a church and interfere in any way with its religious ordinances. But when a church organization asks the benefit of the law by an act of incorporation, it must submit itself to the great primal law of the, of the Union, the Constitution of the United States. It can have the aid it seeks only by submitting to this law. Now there are a number of things in what he said here that I don't have time to explore. One of the things that he said, obviously, is when you ask to incorporate, you put yourself under the authority and the jurisdiction of the government because you are asking for their benefit. The other thing that's interesting here, and this is, I believe, misunderstood in our day, is the fact that he said once you ask for an act of incorporation, you put yourself under what? 
the Constitution of the United States. We have a lot of people arguing today how oh, churches have no constitutional rights, but unincorporated churches have constitutional rights. Foolishness. Incorporated churches have constitutional rights. They have rights that are defined and limited by the Constitution. Unincorporated churches, lordship churches, have no constitutional rights because lordship churches are spiritual entities, not legal entities, who therefore have no relationship to the Constitution. And Sumner noted that in 1872. Here are some of the cases that frame the issue for us. This is uh, from uh, Layman versus Piggly Wiggly. I'm pleased to announce that Piggly Wiggly was not a church. <laughs> <laughs> However, the case itself was instructive. <laughs> case from 1944. A corporation exists by force of legislative action. Its inception and the duration of its power determined by law when the time approaches for its dissolution, it is dependent on the will of, watch this, its creator, yes. as expressed in legislative enactments. And who shall have the right to question its existence and the measure of its powers is likewise determined by the author of its being. In Ohio, that sovereign will is expressed in the General Corporation Act. Now, I want you to notice some key words that I've obviously put in the yellow, which is not in the original decision for those of you that are legal researchers. All right? Dependent on the will of its creator. In order to incorporate a church, you have to recognize that the state is the creator of that church as opposed to that which uh, Brother McCurry so well defined for us this morning, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator of the church. We now have two different creators. See, there is a, there is a belief in our day that the, that the whole incorporation thing, number one, is a new, new kid on the block. As you can see, it is not. Way back in the 1700s, people were fighting against this thing because it was a wrong submission away from the uh, protection and the sovereignty of God. Secondly, we are being we are being told that actually we're uh, that there is no reason why you cannot be a real lordship church and recognize Christ as Lord and at the same time be a corporation. Here is reason number one. Because you have to recognize a different creator than God for the church. And when you recognize that the church is the creator, you then run into the problem that you have a sovereign will, which is a state sovereign will, not the sovereign will of God. So the corporation then is created by another. It has the author of its being, that is the one who dictates its policies, and the sovereign will under which it is ruled are all separate from God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I have therefore created an entity which I claim is under the lordship of Christ, which does not recognize Christ as its creator. It is, a, it is an entity which does not recognize the word of God as its sole authority, and it is an organization that is not under the sovereign will of God because, folks, sovereignty is exclusive. That means if someone is sovereign, he is the sole authority over something. If there are two authorities over something, neither one of them is the sole authority, neither one of them is sovereign. If the state of Ohio, in this case, was sovereign over the corporation, God then could not be sovereign over the corporation. You see. This is a Syrian Antioch in St. George's Orthodox Church. I'd like to have that on your business card. And uh, it's a 1927 case from Massachusetts. In its nature, an act of incorporation is not a contract between the corporate body and the individuals composing it. We're not getting together, the few of us here, and we, and we gather together and make an agreement to, to be incorporated. No, no, no. Instead, it is a compact between the creating government on the one side and the creative corporation on the other side, the corporation can come to an end only by some act of the sovereign power by which it was established. This is important to know because it comes up later in a recent case. All right? But the bottom line here is that we are making a contract, a compact, an agreement with the state that creates the corporation. This is not us gathering together. And that's the reason why 
you find incorporated churches have trustees. Trustee, by the way, is not a biblical office. You'll search your Bible and never find that. That's something else that comes up in a little while. Trustees are not a biblical <laughs> office. They are a corporate office. And uh, Brother Campbell was mentioning the fact about the, about the, uh, the property, and we'll go get to this later, but the trustees of a not-for-profit corporation hold the property in trust for the state. So they own the property, and they own the property on behalf of the state. Interesting case in Florida on that we'll talk about later. <coughs> this is from Matthews versus Adams, which is a Florida case from 1988, pretty recent case for us. Appellants, the church, appeal on the basis that the circuit court had no authority over them because they are a recognized religious organization, a church. On first reflection, they appeared to be correct. However, when the members of the church decided to incorporate their body under the laws of the state of Florida, they submitted themselves to the jurisdiction of the state courts. Two interesting things here. First of all, he said, the court now has jurisdiction because they have chosen to incorporate. That's what gave them jurisdiction. And secondly, they submitted themselves to the jurisdiction before the incorporation. They were not under the jurisdiction of the court. The court recognized the fact that they were not under the jurisdiction of the court until they submitted themselves to the jurisdiction of the court. It is foolishness in our day, and we got a lot of guys doing this, and it upsets me, we got a lot of these guys who have incorporated churches, incorporated whatevers, but they've got these incorporated churches, and then the state comes down and says, well, you have to do this, that, and the other thing. And they say, bless God, I'll go to jail before I'll do that. I'm going to take a stand for Jesus. I'm not taking a stand for Jesus. You're taking a defiant, rebellious stand against the contract that you made with the state in the first place. That's right. It was a voluntary submission, and when you voluntarily submitted yourself under the jurisdiction of the state, you said, I will obey you. Amen. And to do otherwise is somewhat less than honest, to be real honest. This is my favorite case. This is Hollins versus Edmonds, 1981 case. Once the church determined to enter the realm of Caesar by forming a corporation, it was required to abide by the rules of Caesar, or in this case, the statutes of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. It's interesting. A lot of people they say, "Well, you know, they don't render under Caesar. But we don't have Caesar anymore. Foolishness. We found Caesar. He's right here in Hollins versus Edmonds." <laughs> Once the church determined to enter the realm of Caesar by incorporating, right? A. Listen to me carefully. The Bible says, says, "Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's." A church belongs to God. <coughs> An incorporation belongs to Caesar. When I incorporate, I enter, please notice, enter the realm of Caesar. The church is not within the realm of Caesar. People say to me all the time, well, aren't you worried that they pass this law and pass that law? I say, no, it has nothing to do with us. You know, we're not, we're not even an entity that is perceived under the law. We are not a legal entity to which the law applies. So I don't worry about those things. I'm not looking for exemption. I'm just not under that situation. We're not even part of that, part of that system. But when we incorporate a church, we enter the realm of Caesar. By the way, most churches, before they incorporated, were unincorporated. <laughs> and they were a church and then they decided we need to be something else <laughs> this being a church just don't cut it with me <laughs> okay I gotta become something else I know what let's do let's become a corporation and instead of just being under the Lord's jurisdiction let's enter the realm of Caesar and when I enter the realm of Caesar, I come under that scripture that says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. When you incorporate, 
It doesn't matter whether you incorporate as a church or you incorporate as a General Motors. It doesn't matter. You sign incorporation papers, and one of the things that the incorporation papers say is, I agree to abide by all the corporate laws of the state, even though I have no idea in the world what those will be in the future. They don't usually put that last part right in the paperwork. <laughs> Barnes versus First Parish of Falmouth. This is a uh, this is 1810. Barnes attempted to enforce incorporation of Falmouth Baptist. This is quoted from a case way back in, in way later in 1880 or 1980 something. Barnes attempted to enforce incorporation of Falmouth Baptist, who believed that incorporation was unchristian surrender to the state. This is 1810. This is not new stuff. This is not some bright idea that Brother McCurry came up with in 1965. This is something that has a historical position of those churches who wanted to be under the Lordship of Christ since the beginning of this nation. Let me deal with two recent cases. And let me say this. I want to deal with the Indianapolis Baptist Temple case. And the reason I want to deal with the Indianapolis Baptist Temple case is because there is a lot of misinformation around. We run into pastors all the time that go, oh, I know, boy, if you unincorporate your church, then this is what happens to you, and so forth. And I want you to understand what went wrong in the Indianapolis Baptist Temple case. This is not an attack on anybody. This is simply a factual account of some of the problems that we need to be aware of in the, in the, situation, that we're, in the situation that we're in, yeah. because we need to know what went wrong. That's right. Okay? If I, if I incorporate my church, am I going to lose my building? Are they going to come down on me and destroy me and attack me and so forth and so on? And uh, so what went wrong? First of all, the church deliberately amended its articles of incorporation. Indianapolis Baptist Temple was incorporated since 1955 up until the middle 80s. So it was a long-standing corporation. And uh, the church deliberately amended its Articles of Incorporation when they sought to unincorporate the church to continue the church's parent corporation, Indianapolis Baptist Temple, Inc., to read that the sole purpose of this corporation was to, quote, continue any litigation prior to 62883 and any future litigation and legal responsibilities not assumed by the church. So in the, in the amending of their Articles of Incorporation, they said, we're, we're going to try to remove the religious element, if you will, from the corporation, but we are going to continue the corporation for the purpose of dealing with litigation, notice, past and future, and legal responsibilities. So, when the, when the government comes against them in this situation and, and attacks, they're dealing with a corporation the church part of it per se, but the corporation which has been continued for the sole purpose of dealing with legal issues. Therefore, the state came rightfully against the corporation which was extended to accomplish that one purpose. Right? Secondly, the church in May of 87 transferred all of its assets to Gregory Jerome Dixon, the church's pastor, as trustee. Okay? A trustee, by definition, is the person, quote, required by law to execute a trust, unquote. A trustee is a legal corporate office. It is not a scriptural office, right? Steward, by the way, is a scriptural, is a scriptural term. Trustee is not. A trustee is a legal term, a legal, a legal position, and in that sense is a position that is governed by certain statute law and certain and certain requirements that the law requires of a fiduciary in a trustee position. And what we've run into here, and, and a lot of you, by the way, not having to do with the church at all, but a lot, there's a lot of misinformation about trust in general, that somehow trusts are outside of the realm of the world, and they're not. All right? A trustee is a person who has a legal fiduciary responsibility to execute the trust and to execute the trust on behalf of the, or for the benefit of the beneficiary of the trust. So all of the assets were transferred to a trustee. The fact that it was 
the pastor of the church is an irrelevancy to the fact that it was transferred to a trustee. We created a trust. Now, folks, I want you to understand, we went through this basically here, did we not, Brother Warren? If you put the church in a trust, you have not significantly changed the issue from putting it into a corporation. If you're going to put it into a trust, you might as well keep it in a corporation. Because either one will bring you jurisdictionally in the same situation and put you in the same relationship to the government, except for the difference in paperwork. A trustee is one who has a legal responsibility to the government to execute a proper, a proper fiduciary responsibility. And if he fails in that fiduciary responsibility to act in the best interest of the beneficiary, he is legally liable and subject to the jurisdiction of the courts. And that's where we were here. Thirdly, of the other corporations which the church started, there were eight at one time. Of the other corporations which the church started, Indianapolis Baptist Schools was dissolved administratively by the Secretary of State in April 20th, 1992. Now, I want to stop here for a moment and go back to one thing that we looked at before. Do you remember when it was talking about the fact that when the church or when the incorporation comes under the jurisdiction of the state, that it has to abide by the rules of the state and that the corporation can be dissolved only by an act of the sovereign power. Yes. Remember? Yes. Okay. This corporation was dissolved administratively by the state in 1992. There was no paper filed requesting that this, that this corporation be dissolved. If there, there were no steps taken to ask the sovereign power to do this and to, and, to, and to follow through the rules and regulations for doing so. Rather, the corporation was dissolved in 1992 by the Secretary of State, which has three years minimum that they can revive the corporation for any purpose that the state feels is necessary because the corporation is their baby. So consequently, when it did, did, uh, dissolves the corporation in 92, the, the state has at least until 1995, and in some cases longer, but at least until 95 to revive that corporation for any purpose it needs to deal with the corporation. Annual reports were filed by someone at the church from the years 88, 87, 88, and 89, so it's a three-year period after that before the state dissolves it, and then they've got three years after that. Three of these years on which the Internal Revenue placed liens. So what the Internal Revenue Church was replacing liens on was a corporation still on active status, not an unincorporated lordship church at that point. One further thought. The church was represented by an attorney. An attorney is an officer of the court. An organization is uh, an organization entering the court, being represented by an officer of the court, admits to the jurisdiction of the court. First of all, let me broaden my subject here. Lordship churches, A, do not use attorneys, and B, do not go to court. The reason why they do not do that is because they are not under the jurisdiction of the court, but the day the Lordship Church steps into a court and says, hi, here we are because you asked us to be here, they have admitted to the jurisdiction of the court. Secondly, when you hire an officer of the court to represent you in the court that you say doesn't have jurisdiction over you, and you hire an officer of the court to come and represent you in that court, and say, hi, we're here to say you don't have any jurisdiction, the judge has to chuckle. <laughs> now let me see here. I asked you to come to court, and you showed up. You hired one of our guys to come and represent you, and you're trying to tell me you don't belong here? Doesn't work. All right? So this concept of an, of an attorney representing a lordship church in a situation where we're trying to say you don't have... Now, does that mean that we never use attorneys? No. Law Center has attorneys that we work with, but never in this situ in a situation like this. You cannot 
You cannot, when you're trying to represent the fact that the church is not under the jurisdiction of a court, you cannot go to that court and use an officer of that court to say, hi, you don't have jurisdiction. All right? So in my opinion, this is just my opinion, you understand? It's not even in our book. But in my opinion, the case was lost here. We can look at these other things, and we listed seven or eight in our book, and you can look at the other things and say, well, yeah, I see where, where this happened and that happened. The other thing, in my opinion, the case is lost here. The Baptist Temple case is not a true or accurate example of what would happen if a church did not come under, under corporate status right. because it was not incorporated. In other words, you can't say, okay, if my church is not incorporated, it's a lordship church and it's pure and so forth, it, this same thing will happen to it. No, because this is not an illustration of that kind of a case. This case is an example to all incorporated churches that they must agree to go by the corporate laws which they deliberately volunteer to put themselves under. In other words, if you're going to get out from under the corporate status, you have to follow the corporate law in order to get the sovereign will to excuse you and to disband your corporation so that you can become what you want to become. All right? So, again, it's not a, it's not a matter of, this is a matter that mistakes were made and those mistakes were costly but we need to understand that this is not just the general case with every incorporated church. We have never, for instance, had a, had a church in court. I take that back. We had a church in court because it was in court when they came to us. We've never taken a church in court. All right? We don't believe that churches belong in court. We had a church in Wisconsin who came to us and said, Hi, you know, we need help because we're going to lose our property because we lost in the local court. So we appealed to the uh, we appealed to the appellate court of Wisconsin and said, "Hi, the local court made a mistake because they thought they had jurisdiction over this church and they don't." And the appellate court said, "You're right; they don't have jurisdiction over this court or over this uh, this church." By and large, we don't we don't go to court because we deal with the issues. Now, as I stand here today, since 1987. We have never had an issue with a with a church that we could not resolve without the church compromising its stand. Okay, now tomorrow that may change. But as of today, the Lord has been awfully good to us, and we've been able to deal with every issue that we have faced and been able to and been able to resolve the issue without ever uh, without ever having a church having to compromise its, its convictions. And so but one of the problems we have is that we have a lot of people who have accused us of being soft because we don't stand on the front porch and shake our fist and you know threaten violence and that kind of stuff. We deal with we deal with uh, county officials or attorney generals. I dealt with uh, I dealt with uh, Skippy Humphrey, Hubert Humphrey's grandson, when he was when he was the attorney general in, in Minnesota. And I talked to him about a, a situation up there as a property tax issue. And I explained to him our position. And when I got done, he said, let me ask you a couple of questions. I said, fine. He said, does the church own property in its own name? I said, no. He said, does the church have vehicles that are licensed to the church? I said, no. He said, does the church accept tax deductible gifts? I said, no. He said, well, at least you're consistent. I understand your position. And that resolved the issue. He, uh, he uh, instructed the uh, folks there that that, our, that the church there was not taxable, not exempt. It wasn't taxable. So there is a difference in the way you deal with these things. Falwell versus Lynchburg in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The battle to give back ground already taken. Something we don't do real often. But uh, fortunately, Jerry Falwell was a groundbreaker in this area. Since the days of Madison, it was impossible, illegal, to incorporate a church in the state of Virginia. Could not be done. Basically because of Madison and uh, his relationship with John Leland, some of the folks back there, it has never been possible to incorporate a church in the state of Virginia until 2003. So we had one state where not only 
Was it okay to be unincorporated? You couldn't even be incorporated. By the way, just, just a passing thought. Just because a church does not have incorporation papers does not make them a lordship church. We have a lot of pastors around who have unincorporated their church. They got rid of their paperwork and all that kind of thing. And uh, But they're still corporate churches here, and they're still unincorporated associations in the eyes of the state and still under their jurisdiction because they have not shed the mindset. That's the reason we try to emphasize the lordship mindset. What we need to do is get into the Word of God, as Brother Bob was doing this morning. We need to get into the Word of God and find out what a church is supposed to be rather than just trying to determine what a church is not supposed to be. Yeah. And we work from the negative side and never get to the positive side. The Falwell case challenged the constitutionality of several provisions in the Virginia Constitution and the Code of Virginia that impose unique limitations on churches, specifically Article 4, Section 14, Number 20, which banned churches from incorporating. And in addition, Section 57, Number 12 of the Code of Virginia, which limits the amount of real property a church may own to 50 acres within a city or town and 250 acres in any one county. So there were certain limitations that were put on churches as far as the ownership of property and as far as the fact that they were not allowed to incorporate. While the church noted that such provision preventing the, while the court noted that such provision preventing the incorporation of churches violated the U.S. Constitution and lacked facial neutrality, it did note that the likely explanation, this is interesting because the court said this, it noted that the likely explanation for the existence of Section 14 is that drafters believe that state incorporation of individual churches was inconsistent with the principles of Mr. Jefferson's Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom and that any infringement of religious freedom constituted an infringement of a natural right of mankind. The court said, although we understand the constitutional argument here, we understand where this law came from. Where the law came from is because back in the day of Jefferson and Madison, that crowd, they looked at incorporation of church as establishing a, a state church and as a violation of religious freedom. Therefore, we understand why we have this law, even though we understand the constitutional argument. Judge Moon, in his court opinion, stated, Plaintiff's motion, that is, Falwell's motion for summary judgment, is unopposed. In other words, the state of Virginia offered no defense against the incorporation of churches in Virginia. <laughs> the state offered no resistance, no arguments, no appeals on the ruling. To the contrary, they offered their blessing on church incorporation. When the, when the case was filed against the commissioners uh, of uh, actually just the one commissioner uh, on, the, on the Lynchburg Commission, this guy did, never claimed his, his opportunity to uh, say, you know, I'm a government official, I can't be sued. He did not claim, you know, I'm not the only guy on this commission. There's a whole commission here that needs to be included in this lawsuit. He never filed a response. So Falwell went to the court and filed his and filed his case to sue in order to be able to incorporate, and nobody responded. <laughs> One rather telling demonstration of the case is the fact that the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, joined the, co joined the church as a friend of the court. <laughs> the ACLU helped defend the church and argued that the church should, after all, be incorporated. Yeah, you know, there is a certain amount of truth to the fact that one can be identified by their friends and their enemies. tend more to be identified by our enemies. Uh, in this case, Falwell tended to be more identified by his friends. Um, when the American Civil Liberties Union joins the church and says, yeah, we're with you, 
it's time to reassess your position. <laughs> the judge, ruling uncontested, knowing that his ruling would not be appealed because there wasn't even a response file, changed over 200 years of Virginia law whose statesmen of the past warned that corporations be setting up a state church. Listen to what John Leland said. John Leland said, the Church of Rome was at first constituted according to the gospel. And at that time, her faith was spoken out through the whole world, being espoused to Christ as a chaste virgin. She kept her bed pure for her husband almost 300 years. But afterwards, she played the whore with the kings and princes of this world, who with their gold and wealth came in unto her, and she became a strumpet. And as she was the first Christian church that ever forsook the laws of Christ for her conduct and received the laws of his rivals, that is, was established by human law and governed by the legalized edicts of councils and received large sums of money to support her preachers and her worship by the force of civil power, she is called the mother of harlots. And all Protestant churches who are regulated by law force people to support their preachers, build meeting houses, and otherwise maintain their worships, are daughters of this unholy mother. That's pretty strong stuff. This was the opinion of the people who set up the law in Virginia that was overturned by Judge Moon. Benjamin Hoadley, or Isaac Skillman, who also was from that area, wrote... I am of Benjamin Hoadley's mind, who was afterwards Bishop of Winchester. When he was His Majesty's chaplain, he told the King of England in his sermon upon these words, My kingdom is not of this world, that it was not in the power, right, or authority of any pope, prince, or potentate, of any king, lords, or commons, of any bishop, archbishops, deacons, or prebends, of any vicar, clergy or curates of any synods, convocation or presbyteries, to make any laws for the Church of Christ, that the Church of God has no dependence upon the state, nor any human power or authority, but only on the power of God and His Word, that it was a distinct kingdom from the world and has nothing to do with any worldly power. Pretty strong word. You see, we have come to a place where we have a difficult time recognizing the distinction between a church and a religious organization. I get calls all the time from, from people who uh, pastors around the country, and those, those fellows will call and they'll say, you know, they're long distance from California or Oregon or Washington, whatever, and uh, they'd like to know if, uh, you know, if I could just explain to them in five minutes or less this whole incorporation thing. After uh, almost 20 years working with the law center and a little over 3,000 hours worth of research and so forth, it's difficult to reduce it down to that five-minute time frame. And usually I just say to those people, well, it's real simple. If the church in the Bible did it, I think you should go ahead and do it. And if the church in the Bible didn't do it, I think you probably shouldn't, and you'll be fine. Inevitably, somebody says, well, uh, yeah, they didn't borrow money. And I say, see, you're learning already. <laughs> but it boggles the mind that you talk to preachers, and these pastors, you say, you just, I, I, we did a seminar years ago. I had about 30, 40 preachers there, and we did six hours. We get done with six hours worth of uh, worth of teaching on the subject, and uh, said, "Okay, anybody have a question?" And the fellow sitting right down here in the second row, right on the end, raised his hand. I said, "Yes." He said, uh, "Okay, after you unincorporate the church, and uh, and you know you're unregistered and everything." Yes. He said, "Then who do you know? Who do you like?" Uh, 
register with. <laughs> I thought we saying, you know, I think we'll start over. <laughs> Six hours and the guy wants to register with somebody. Please, let me register with somebody. Because there is a misperception, most of the pastors in America today, and this is a shame, do not know what it means to be a church. Most churches today, if, if God died, they wouldn't know it for five years. Because they've got the programs and they got the this and that and the other thing. They're just going on their way. You know, they, they're not they're not spending enough time with the Lord to know if he's there or not. And we've got the we've got the program, we've got the plan, we've got the organization, we've got the entity. One of the reasons why we have corporations, we'll talk about this uh, I think this evening. One of the reasons why we have corporations is perpetuity. See? I have to have an organization to keep this thing going because God can't handle it. There's a problem there. We had a situation in uh, Florida. I can never remember the name of the place, but uh, where the church down there uh, was incorporated, the pastor decided not to follow the rules to unincorporate Brother Warren, and uh, he decided he'd just sort of let the thing die. Well, three years into letting it die, uh, somebody gave the church $25,000 for missions. They had a Christian school there, which the pastor felt was an important ministry of the church which had some great needs and so he took ten thousand dollars of that money and invested it in the Christian school and so forth. It does not matter whether you agree with what he did or not. The point is two of his deacons, trustees, did not agree with what he did. So they went down to Tallahassee, they filed three annual reports for the corporation to bring it up to date listing themselves as the trustees of the corporation. Then they went back and they told the pastor, get out. Went all the way to the Supreme Court of Florida. The Supreme Court of Florida is very kind. They said to the pastor, they said, pastor, you need to understand, there is a church here which is a spiritual entity. And there is a corporation here which is a legal entity. And the corporation owns your building, and they don't want you or your church in it. Okay? Again, a simple matter. People say, oh, that was a terrible decision. No, it wasn't a terrible decision. The judge's decision was a terrible decision. The pastor's decision was a terrible decision not to follow the rules that he had agreed to follow in order to disengage himself from that situation so that his church would not be under that jurisdiction and subject to that kind of problem. rebellious, loud little boy who grew up without any self-discipline and you became the drunken lush you are today. <laughs> Mr. Donovan was shocked. Did not know what else to say, so he stammered out and looked at, do, do you know Mr. Shaw, the prosecutor? And she said, oh yes. I know Mr. Shaw. He was a lazy student who did not do his own work. He lied and cheated on his schoolwork. And now he lies and cheats on his wife. The judge said, could we have a sidebar? <laughs> he called both of the attorneys to the, to the bench. And he said, if 
either one of you ask her if she knows me, I will send you to the electric chair. <laughs> this second in the series and we've dealt with actually in the uh, in the context of the panel discussion we dealt with a lot of these issues and uh, yet I'm going to reiterate them for the purpose of being able to expand on them just a little bit and put them into a context for you and so we'll try to be of some help that way tomorrow morning Lord willing we're going to deal with the uh, subject of the pictures and challenges uh, the biblical pictures and challenges of the church and uh, what uh, what we're facing today as Lordship Churches. A lot of people ask that question, and we'll try to deal with those tomorrow morning. There's also just in passing, and uh, Pastor Campbell and I have been trying to work out a potential a time frame. There is a lot of junk out today concerning the subject of incorporation. There are a lot of things being said and done and so forth that are just really off-the-wall scams. And uh, one of the reasons why I think we find a lot of resistance in dealing with a lot of, with a lot of pastors is the fact that they, get, they hear about this and that and the other thing that's going on, and they're scared to death of uh, what's going to be said. And we try to be very, very cautious and stick to a very biblical program but uh, there, are some, there are some dangers out there that you need to be aware of and you need to be careful of. And if we're able to do it, we're going to try to work out a time for about a half an hour. Well, I'd like to at least go through one of those things with you and just give you some information on a, on a problem that is uh, being pretty well widespread and I believe is uh, stealing from our churches. In the meantime, let's talk this evening about uh, the biblical legal problem some of the practical issues involved for those who have a biblical approach to the church. <coughs> First of all, this was mentioned today in the panel, it is an unequal yoke with unbelievers. It's amazing that over the years, we as pastors have told our young people, you ought not to date and you ought not to marry unsaved young people. At least I trust you've been telling your young people because it's an unequal yoke, and we use that and we say, the Bible says you ought not to be unequally yoked together. Uh, less often do we find pastors who are willing to relate that to the business world and say, you ought not to be unequally yoked together, you ought not to be partners with a, with a lost person, be in business with a, with a person who's not a believer as well. Rarely do we hear a pastor understand the issue that when the church which is the body of Christ, the spiritual entity, allies itself in a covenant relationship or a contract relationship with the state, it is unequally yoked with unbelievers. Right. No one, I think, at this point will, will try to postulate the fact that in the end result, Governor Schwarzenegger and the California government are indeed believers after all, and therefore, it is not an unequal yoke. I think everybody is willing to accept the fact that when the church allies themselves with that crowd in Sacramento or Salem or wherever the case may be, we are allying ourselves with a group of unbelievers and we have unequally yoked ourselves together because they are going to dictate what the church can and cannot do and how the church can operate. It is interesting to me that people say, well, you know, uh, we're incorporated and all that kind of thing, but you know, we still are, you know, a lordship church and all this kind of thing. Uh, first of all, why do you have a constitution and bylaws? Well, people say, well, you know, our constitution and bylaws is based on the Bible. Well, folks, here's the question. If I got a Bible, why do I need a constitution and bylaws? You see, if the if the bylaws are based on the on the, on the Bible, then I don't need them both. Now the other problem is I start taking those people's constitutions and bylaws, and I begin to find that a lot of it isn't based on the Bible. We mentioned today about trustees that's not in the Bible. Now, treasurer on the other hand 
is an officer <laughs> in a lot of churches. But, you know, I mean, you've got to give that to Judas so you can say, yeah, that's in the Bible. But I'm not sure that's the kind of example we want to follow. You see what I'm saying? So there is a lot of, there is a lot of constitution and bylaws things, a lot of things that go on in the church that have nothing to do with the Word of God. And we are bound to do those things because corporate law requires those things and we end up in an unequal yoke with unbelievers and what that causes is we begin to act the way they want us to act. You know, when we get in an unequal yoke with the, with, the, with the unbelievers, they don't ever start acting the way we do. They never just automatically start acting like believers and, and you know, they always want to drag us down and that's especially true in the church situation because when we recognize them as a sovereign and creator, they have the authority to cause us to act like they want us to act. <clears throat> Secondly, not only is it an unequal yoke with unbelievers, it recognizes a sovereign other than God. And we mentioned that this morning. But in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. <clears throat> Colossians 1.18, the Bible says that Jesus is the head of the church. When we have a corporation, people have said, well, you actually have two heads to the church, a two-headed monster. Mm -hmm. In actual fact, that's not true. In actual fact, you still only have one head. It's just not the Lord Jesus Christ. The Piggly Wiggly case, remember, indicated the fact that there was a single sovereign over a corporation, and that sovereign was the state. So we have recognized not another sovereign with Christ. We have recognized a sovereign different than Christ over the church. And when we get into a situation where we recognize a sovereign other than God over the church, we have not only destroyed the concept of lordship, we have taken away the whole concept of church. The church has now become something else. It has become an entity other than the spiritual entity that Jesus founded. Incorporation is a direct violation of Scripture because it's an unequal yoke. It recognizes the sovereign other than God, and it gives God's property to the state. Turn over with me to 2 Corinthians, just because I want to read the Scripture here. And we're going to talk about this for a minute because this is a real sticky area. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15. The Bible says, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So he said, What concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Now, we gather the tithes and offerings, and that is money that at least is postulated to have been given to God. Can we all agree with that? Yes. Good. Give your tithes and offerings to God. It comes in the offering plate. We go out, we buy a piece of property, we build a building. And we build that building and buy that property with money that has been given to God. Therefore, that money is God's money. If we are using God's money to buy a piece of property and build a building... That piece of property in that building ought to belong to? But when we as a incorporation purchase a piece of property and build a building and we title it to the name of that corporation, that building now belongs to the state. And the trustees of that not-for-profit corporation hold that property in trust for the state. Is not that the very thing we found out in Nebraska, Brother Bob? Yes. They said, no, this is the church padlocking what? Its own building. Right. Yeah. So we have taken now God's money. We have purchased a piece of property building. And then we have taken that property purchased with God's money and given it to the state. Is there a problem with that? Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting.
how often we can bring these things out and preachers will sit here and look at this thing and go, wow, that's a, that's a, real, that's a real problem. And five years later, they're still discussing and incorporating their church. There's something wrong with that kind of lack of repentance, I think. There is no concord, there is no agreement between Christ and, or between a believer and infidel, between Christ and Belial. We cannot yoke up with these people. We cannot take God's property and turn that over to them. Now, a lot of people ask me and say, how do you hold property? Because this was a major problem. And, and since Brother Bob has been kind enough to set the example of not mentioning names, I will not mention names, at least in this session. Um, but we had a uh, we had a fellow who goes around holding seminars on the subject and charging significant amounts of money to unincorporate churches. And this fellow contacted us and wanted us to review his book and give him some some insights. And we read his book and wrote him seven pages of what we considered to be important things that needed to be changed in his book. And one of the things that we ask is, what are you going to do with the church property? His response to that was to publish the book exactly as he'd written it in the first place. And his response to the question, what are you going to do with the church property, is, I have not decided yet. What he did with the church property is not a thing. And we have since had to work with five or six churches that he went, took through the process of unincorporating and going back and try to deal with their property. We had a church in Arizona that unincorporated a do-it-yourself type of a project. They unincorporated their church, and five years later, they decided to sell the property when they had a problem. The problem was owned by a, by a defunct, not-for-profit corporation. And in fact, if the state of Arizona had bothered to recognize that fact, the property would have been owned by the state of Arizona. We went back, we went to Arizona, we incorporated the church again, disposed of the property out of the corporation, and then unincorporated the church. You see. The property issue is a, is a major issue. People say, how do you hold property? Let me explain to you that there are three ways to hold property. You can hold property as an individual. You can hold property as a corporation. You can hold property as an unincorporated association. Therefore, if your church holds property in its own name and it's not a corporation, what is it? It's an unincorporated association. It's the only choice left. We have all these churches that have gotten rid of all their little paperwork, and they're so proud of themselves because they're not incorporated anymore, and we just fought one of these battles in Indiana, but the thing is, the thing owns property in its own name, therefore it is an unincorporated association. You say, well, why is that true? That doesn't seem fair. If the church purports itself to be an entity that can hold property, a legal entity, therefore, that can sue and be sued and contract to own property, is it not right that the government takes them at their own word? So you say, how do you folks hold property? Now, pay attention to me, because I'm going to say this very carefully. We hold property in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a right way and a wrong way to do that. If you do it wrongly, either nobody can ever sell the property, or anybody can sell the property. Okay? It has to be done properly. And we're very explicit about that. But the point is, we were told, oh, you can't hold property in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've done it in 31 states now. They say, well, if you hold property in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can never sell it. We've done that in nine states now. We've done it with the, we, we've done it with the assistance of the lead counsel of the uh, Department of Revenue in the state of, of Washington and the state of uh, Pennsylvania. All these things are doable if you do them correctly. We recognize in the deed that Jesus Christ is the true and beneficial owner of the property that has been purchased with his money. You say, how can he hold property? Simple. He's an individual. The property bought with his money, 
needs to bear his name and recognize that literally, legally, Jesus Christ is the owner of the property. It is on that basis, by the way, that we primarily establish our property tax situation, saying this is God's property, you have no right to tax. Incorporation is a compromise of principle. First of all, it, it binds God's people to their own hurt. And this is where we go back to Joshua chapter 9, and uh, we'll not turn there, but in Joshua chapter 9, verses 19 to 20, and actually that whole section, you will recall that the uh, Gibeonites come to the Israel and said, man, we've heard about you, and we've heard about your God, and we're afraid that you're going to come over and destroy us, and so here we are. And uh, we want to make a league with you in the contract, and we want to be your friends. And the Joshua and the elders of Israel said, well, where did you come from? And they said, oh, just way over there when we left home, you know. I mean, we went down to men's, men's warehouse and bought these suits brand new. And uh, these shoes, they were the floor shine things. I mean, brand new stuff. And our, and our wives just baked this bread for us fresh. I mean, we've come a long, long way. And Joshua and the elders looked at each other and said, ha, ha, bunch of idiots, we were never going to get that far, but I mean, you know, we can make slaves of these people good for us. So they sign a contract. They make an agreement. Three days later, Israel goes over the hill, and guess who they find? It's the Gibeonites. And the people say, all right, let's go wipe these people out. Joshua says, we have made an agreement that we would not. As I believe as Brother Weaver mentioned this morning, 400 years later, King Saul killed some of the Gibeonites and God judged Israel for, his, for that reason. God was serious. Were, but you say, but they were deceived. Yes, they were. They were deceived, and they made a bad decision. Well, if they were deceived, it shouldn't count. Isn't that what we hear from the Patriot movement all the time? Well, we were deceived, therefore it doesn't count. Well, Joshua was deceived. That shouldn't count. Here's the problem. When Joshua, when Joshua discussed this thing with God, God said, if you had asked me, The problem was not the deception. The problem was they didn't seek God's counsel because God would have displayed the deception. I talk to preachers all the time whose churches are incorporated and who incorporated the churches, not just the guys that walked into one. And I say, you know, why did you decide to incorporate? I have never, 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 and I've been doing this since 1987 with the Law Center, I have never had a preacher say to me, we spent a long time in prayer, we really prayed about and poured over our Bible, this is even like a thing to do. Every one of them says, well, I went to Bible college, and they said, I talked to Reverend so-and-so, and he said, yep. you say, but those people were deceived. Now listen to me very carefully. I believe the one thing that solves that problem is what Brother McCurry was talking about, and that's repentance. We have a right to repent. We have a right to get down before God and say, we have been foolish, we have made a mistake, we have, we have gone our own way, we have not consulted you, we have not been true to the word of God, we have not recognized you as the Lord of our church. And we repent of that, but you see, until we do that, until we repent, we are bound to our own hurt. Which means what? It means if you're an incorporated church and the government says to you, you ought not to speak out on political issues like homosexual marriage, you ought to keep your mouth shut. Why? Because you have bound yourself to do that. If you are, if you are, if you have a Christian school and it's incorporated, and the state says, well, you need to hire a few homosexual teachers, 
then you need to either hire a few homosexual teachers or close the thing down because you have promised to do that. If you decide you're going to repent, then you need to get out of the corporation by going through all of the process that's required. Why? Because you have promised to do that. Right? We are bound to our own hurt. It is a compromise of principle. The Bob Jones case was the perfectly good illustration of that, 1979. Their case started in 72, hit the Supreme Court in 1979. And... Uh, the problem with Bob Jones, as was mentioned before, is the fact that they violated public policy. They did nothing illegal, but they did violate public policy, and the court said, you're a, you're a 501c3 organization. You, you received tax-deductible gifts so that you can do what the government will do, so that you can promote the policies, so that you can support these policies, and when you go against public policy, you violate the terms of which you have this exemption, this deductible gift. And again, they said, you understand, a tax deductible gift is a subsidy. The government is supporting your school. You need to support us in return. It was an interesting thing, by the way, just in passing, that a letter went out to all the Bob Jones alumni before the big case in, uh, in the Supreme Court, and uh, they wrote to all their, to their alumni and said, when, as soon as we find out what it is that drug us into this situation and put us in this spot, we're going to write you a letter and let you know, because if it can happen to us, it can happen to you. Well, they went to court, and the court said, your problem is, you're this not-for-profit corporation with the 501c3, <coughs> But that next letter never came, letting everybody know where the problem was. Secondly, it's giving to the state rather than God. It's giving to the state rather than God. In Malachi chapter 3, the Bible talks about bringing you all the tithes into the storehouse, and God talks about opening the windows of heaven and so forth. The tithe is an indication of ownership. It is a recognition of ownership. I do not give a tithe, 10% to the Lord, because I'm being a benefit to God. No. Uh, God needs my money, and so I'm going to give him my 10%. If God needs your money, folks, we're in tremendous trouble. <laughs> God doesn't need your 10%. I give the 10% to God, not because that's the part that God owns, I give the 10% to God, the tithes to God, because I recognize that God owns it all, and that's the way I recognize it, by giving the 10%. The tithe indicates ownership. Now, when we give a tax-deductible gift, right? Follow me here. This is high finance. You give $1,000 to the church. You put it on your tax return and you're in the 30% tax bracket, which means that you get to write off approximately $300 of that off of your income tax, okay? Make it simple. You have, therefore, given God $1,000, and you got a $300 rebate, which means that you actually gave God $700, not the 1000 that you were claiming that you were giving to God. <laughs> <laughs> Ever hear of Ananias and Sapphira? It's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got people say, well, you know, if I didn't get that tax deductible gift, I couldn't afford to give that much. Then who are you giving to? If you're giving to God, and trusting God, you can afford to give that no matter what. If you can't afford to give it without the state giving you a rebate, then folks, you've got a problem. Yeah. Here's what I tell people to do. Okay, if you're gonna give if you're gonna give fifty dollars to the church and you really need that tax deductible gift, take your thirty percent, your fifteen bucks, put it back in your pocket. Put the other 35 in the church and give it to God and get your rebate instantly. <laughs> I 
But at least, at least you know what you really gave to God. <coughs> In the Grove City case, the Bob Jones University case, both times, 62 and 79, the Supreme Court said a tax-deductible gift is a subsidy from the federal government to the receiving organization. And that's the other problem with this tax-deductible gift. It is the idea that somewhere along the line, God cannot handle his own affairs. I have to have the government's helping hand to do the work of God. Every advantage of the corporation is a repudiation of God. First of all, limited liability. We looked at, you could look at Exodus 21 and 22. We talked about this a little bit earlier. But the idea in Exodus 21 and 22 is, hey, you know, if you dig a hole and somebody falls in it, if you build a house and you don't put up a battlement and people fall off, if this happens, if that happens, if the other thing happens, you're responsible. You need to take responsibility. The idea that somewhere along the line the church needs to seek limited liability is a twofold problem. First of all, it is the church trying to avoid responsibility that the Bible says is rightfully theirs. The second problem is, somewhere along the line, we're failing to trust the Lord. Have you ever caught that sense? Well, I've got to have an insurance policy because, you know, if something happens, boy, I've got to have protection. Oh, because if you didn't have that insurance policy, you'd have to trust God instead. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I have to limit my liability because I don't want to take responsibility because God may put me in one of those spots that's just too tough for me. <laughs> See, I believe this sincerely. And I say it often enough that people think I'm being trite. I'm not. I believe that we need to learn to trust the Lord. Amen. I believe we need to just get back to saying, you know what, this is God's work. We're God's people. Let's trust God. I don't need a limited liability. I'm willing to take responsibility for whatever it is that God sends my way. Because I figure whatever it is God sends my way, God will also supply the means to take care of my responsibility. Amen. 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 All right. Ah, the ability to borrow money. Yes. <laughs> You know, if you go to the bank and you don't have an incorporate or a corporation, that bank won't loan you that money. So yeah, you gotta go, you gotta go get that corporation because you gotta borrow that money because I'll tell you what, boy, we've been praying about it and uh, we need this new church building. And uh, we went down to the bank and they're gonna loan us that money at eight percent interest, praise God. <laughs> it drives me nuts. <laughs> To hear these preachers stand up and say, God supplied us a loan at the bank for 8%. <laughs> Can you see God sitting there going, yeah, I'll just sign this paper, pay the interest? My mother-in-law was uh, in a church in Dayton, Ohio. They floated a $6 million bond issue with the, with the people in the church so they could build a new building, paying 13% interest. And I know some of you want the name of that church. So, yeah. no. uh, and I said to my mother-in-law, I said, well, do you think God knows you folks need a new building? She said, well, I guess he does. I said, well, then why doesn't God just send you the money? Well, she didn't know. I had it figured out. When God wanted them to have the building, he just sent them the money. It's that simple. But I'll tell you what, we look at a building project or whatever, and the first thing we think of is, let's go borrow the money, obligate God to pay interest, and then we'll praise God, and, and, and then when we can't make the payment, we'll complain about God not doing his part. <laughs> Instead of that, how about we get down on our knees and we get hold of God and we see God do some great thing and then we give God the glory for what he does. The Bible says, my God shall supply most of your needs except when you have a big building project. <laughs> it's in Philippians 4.19. You'll find it there. 
something that said the revised Weaver version. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And folks, it doesn't matter whether you, whether you, it was an interesting thing. We just moved to Portland, Oregon, for those of you that weren't aware of it. We just moved to Portland, Oregon, and uh, pastored a church there, and uh, we got rid of two cars and reduced ourselves to one a while ago. And when we went to Portland, I thought, I said, you know, I really need, it would really be nice to have a second car because there are just times when my wife and I need to go different directions, you know. And so I've been praying about it, just sort of quietly letting the Lord know that, you know, I felt that this would be a blessing to the ministry. And some guy came up to me and he said, you know, I have a car that we've been trying to sell and it didn't sell and I figured that the Lord must be trying to tell me something, so... I'd like to give that car to you. And I said, well, amen, I'll go down to the bank and borrow as much as I can, brother. <laughs> Amazing thing. I've started four churches. This, the church that I'm pastoring now is the first church I've ever, start, or I've ever pastored that I didn't start. Up until this time, if I wanted to preach, I had to start a church because there was nobody that wanted to. <laughs> and uh, every place I've been, God has given us buildings. May I tell you my favorite story? I don't know how I'm doing time-wise. I'll hurry later if I need to. <laughs> I was in Minnesota, the first church I started. We started a, a church in a... Uh, in a uh, old hardware store. <laughs> in that old hardware store, we were we were meeting there. There was a pizza place right next door, right through the wall. On about eleven thirty, the smells began to walk. <laughs> and you could see that some people were losing their concentration. <laughs> In spite of that, we outgrew the place. We determined that we needed another place to meet, and so we prayed about it, and the guy came in one day, and he said, hey, you know, there's an old church building available at 1000 Rainy Avenue, old church building, but it looks really nice. He said, we ought to go look at it. So we went and looked at this old church building, and it was. It was a nice nice building, you know, good auditorium, had a basement, and had classrooms and offices, and sat on a corner lot there in 1000 Rainy Avenue in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, we looked at it, and we prayed about it, and we determined that God wanted us to have it. And so we, we signed a contract to buy the building, pay cash for it, 90 days. And uh, one of the ladies in the church, his mother just passed away, had received a small inheritance, so she gave us the $500 for earnest money. And uh, I had an interesting crowd there. I had, uh, I had a bunch of folks who had never been to church in their life. First guy I led to the Lord in that church was a uh, was a guy who sold who sold marijuana to people and we went around and won all these people to the Lord that he sold marijuana to but unfortunately those people never been in church some of them for a wedding funeral nothing in their life and uh, we uh, financially were not well off so to speak <laughs> after after approximately uh, a month and a half. Uh, our building fund had grown to zero. <laughs> we didn't have a dime. We owed twenty-seven thousand dollars at five o'clock on a Monday afternoon, and and six weeks later we didn't have a dime of it. I happened to be on the radio there. I was on the local polka station, sort of the polka pastor, if you know what I mean. And uh, well, they gave me a deal: thirty minutes for thirty dollars. You can't beat that. So we were on the radio once a week there in the in the area, and there was a group of people from Faith Baptist Church in downtown, big church in downtown, who listened to our radio broadcast all the time. They called me up and said, hi, we're down in the Golden Ages band, but we'd like you to come and speak. And I said, fine. It wasn't exactly my crowd. I was 26, and I did not get asked to speak to that crowd much. Today, I get asked to speak to that crowd a lot, but not at the time. So I went to the banquet, we owed $27,000 cash for a building on Monday at 5 o'clock, and this was Saturday at 7. 
I had not a dime to my name. I went to that, I went to that meeting, and uh, the guy got up and he said, you know, Pastor Wright, a lot of us listen to your radio broadcast. He said, been hearing about your building. Tell us how that's going before you preach. And I stood up and I said, uh, the Lord hasn't sent the money in yet, but we believe that he will, so keep praying for us. I appreciate it. That was my whole thing. I went ahead and preached my message, and after the, after the meeting, people were coming up and thanking me for coming and so forth. And this older, gray-haired gentleman, tall fellow, came up and he said, Hi, my name is Dr. Molander. He said, I don't go to church here, but somebody invited me for the banquet. But he said, I'd like to sit down and talk to you. Could you come by my house tomorrow afternoon about 3 o'clock? And I said, fine. So on Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock, I went over to Dr. Molander's house. And I walked in, Dr. Molander said, tell me about this building. So I explained to him about the fact that we needed $27,000 to buy this building. And I explained the whole thing to him. And I got done, and he said, it's an interesting thing. He said, 10 years ago, I put some money into some annuities there at the Moody Bible Institute. And those just came to fruition last month. And he said, I've been wondering, praying about what God wants me to do with that money. He said, the total of those two annuities was $27,000. He said, if you come by tomorrow at 3 o'clock, I will give you a cashier's check for $27,000. On Monday at 3 o'clock, I went by Dr. Molander's place and picked up a check for $27,000 and went to a closing at 5 o'clock and paid. I had, I had people in my church who explained to me that they'd been laying awake nights at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning talking about how stupid the preacher was because he wouldn't go to the bank. God is able to supply, and here's the other problem. You say, but what if God doesn't supply? The Bible says he does not withhold from you any good thing. If God doesn't supply it, it's because God doesn't think it's good for you. Our problem is we want to go around that and get it whether God thinks it's good for us. Perpetuity. I love this one. Psalm 127 one says, if the Lord, if the, Unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain. The idea that we have to have a corporation so that this church will go on, perpetuate itself, perpetuity. Folks, if the Lord doesn't keep it going, it isn't of God. If God can't keep it going by himself, he doesn't, it doesn't need to keep going. We don't need a corporation to keep this thing going. God can handle that part. <laughs> Fourth reason why people incorporate is recognition. Uh, recognition. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 5 and verse 44. I want you to see two verses of Scripture. John chapter 5, verse 44. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Now, with that thought in mind, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse 12. Where he says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Unfortunately, that's what's happening in the idea that we need to be recognized by somebody. We need somebody to recognize that we're a church. It's not sufficient that we are a church and that God recognizes it. It's not sufficient that God looks down and says, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. That's not sufficient. We have to have somebody that says, yeah, you're really a church. Because we have to have something that our neighbors respect. And we have to have something that the guys at work respect. And we need to have something that the county respects so that we can be recognized by somebody. This recognition thing is a major issue with a lot of pastors. A lot of pastors 
A lot of pastors do not unincorporate their church because they're scared to death of what the other guys in this fellowship or that fellowship are going to think of them if they do that. Let me give you three principles. Number one, there is no substitute for obedience to God. Turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Let me tell you the story. I think I've got about eight minutes. Is that close? Saul goes off to the battle. God says, go and destroy everything, everybody. Then God comes to Samuel and says, you better go talk to Saul because I sent him out to destroy the enemy and he didn't do that. So Samuel goes out to meet Saul and he says to Saul, why didn't you destroy the enemy? And Saul says, well, we did. We went out and did just exactly what God said. And Saul and Samuel said, do you always go to battle with all these sheep and cows? And Saul said, oh, the sheep and cows. Well, you know, we, we chose the best sheep and cows because the people wanted to uh, bring those back to, uh, you know, <clears throat> to worship the Lord with. And Samuel said, uh, who's that strange-looking Israelite in the back there that's all bound and gagged? And they said, oh, that's the king, a gag, and we brought him back too. And Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. There is no substitute for obedience to God. We can sit around and say, well, you know, our church can do a whole lot more if we've got that tax-deductible gift. And we're concerned that we're going to chase people away and lose them if we're not an incorporated church. And all of the excuses that we make in the practical, pragmatic realm... But it comes down to this. There is no substitute for obedience to God. When the Bible says that Jesus is to be made the head of the church, recognized as the head of the church. He is to be the sovereign over the church. In all things, he is to have the preeminence. There is nothing that we can do in the church, with the church, for the church, through the church, about the church. There is nothing that we can do that is important as the simple step of obedience of having Christ as the head of the church. There is no substitute for obedience to God. Obedience to God is more important than obedience to man. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, you recall that uh, Peter and John were standing on the corner passing out tracts, and the uh, zoning police came by and said, I'm sorry, this corner is not for passing out tracts, and we've told you before that you're not allowed to do that in this zoning area, and so you're going to have to leave. And Peter said, you know, we have to obey God rather than man. In Daniel chapter 3, the Hebrew children, you will recall, are there and the king has his idol. And he says, you know, when the band plays, everybody bows to my image. The band plays, everybody bowed except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It is my opinion, I can't prove this from scripture, it is my opinion that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not standing in the front row throwing rocks at the, at the king. No. I believe they were standing in the very back, inconspicuous, just being obedient to God. And somebody came to the king and said, you know what? Everybody bowed except those three Hebrew guys. And the king said, bring me those three deaf fellows up here. <laughs> and so they brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the king said, here's the deal, guys. See... When the band plays, you bow to my idol. It's a simple process. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, you know, the band can play all day, but we're not going to bow. Simple matter. But you notice they said, O king, and live forever. The band could play all day, but we're going to bow. They, they were respected. But they said, we're not going to bow. He said, I'll tell you what. If you don't bow, I'm going to throw you right in that fiery furnace over there. And who's going to deliver you from me if I do that? And they said, we believe our God can deliver us. 
we believe our God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't deliver us, we still aren't going to bow. See, it's a simple matter. You know, you can see it. Shadrach turning to Abednego and saying, you think we can win? I mean, that wasn't the question. <laughs> you understand? That was never the question. We will not bow. We think God can deliver us. We think God will deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. By the way, they got thrown in the fiery furnace. A lot of people today think that the idea is we've got to find a way to stay out of the fiery furnace. Folks, God may want you in the fiery furnace because God may want to do something greater with you than he can do with you outside. So they were in there, and then all of a sudden, of course, Jesus appeared, and he's walking around, and Shadrach's in there going, you know, it's nice in here. It was a little chilly out there, but this is good. The king came over, and he said, you guys, come on out of there. And, see, Shadrach's like Brother Bob. He's just one of those kind, gentle people. Because if it was me, I'd have said, come in and get us. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't. They came out. <laughs> and God had a purpose in it, folks. What they learned was obedience to God was more important than obedience to man. But here's the other issue. Obedience to God is not just inconvenient. It can be costly. Somebody asked a question during the question and answer session. I don't know who it was, and that's fine. You know, do you know any major problems that the, that the unincorporated or the, or the uh, Lordship Church has had in the last 10 years? And the answer is no, I really don't. That's really not supposed to be a consideration. <coughs> because I want you to know that if we truly are going to obey God, that it will not only be inconvenient, but it can become real costly. Listen to these verses. Hebrews chapter 11 is that great faith chapter. You know, all these people did all these great things, and we hear it all the time. But listen. And others, he just talked about all of those who had all these great victories through faith. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Listen, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. And their friends looked at them and said, obviously you're doing something wrong because if you were doing the right thing, God wouldn't let this happen to you. You would never be afflicted and tormented and destitute, wandering around living in caves if you were doing the right thing. This is only an indication that you don't have the blessing of God. Listen to what God said about them. Of whom the world was not worth. Isaiah is one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. I think I'm going to close with this. Isaiah is one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. You remember Isaiah saw a vision of the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and the seraphims were saying, Holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And God sent an angel with a coal and touched his lips. And Isaiah was so pleased. And the Lord said, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. Yeah, I'll go. Cool. God said, okay, I choose uh, you, Isaiah. Isaiah said, yes. <laughs> Isaiah said, okay, Lord, what does he want me to do? The Lord said, well, here's, here's the situation. I want you to go from coast to coast. I want you to go from one end of the land to the other. I want you to go around. I want you to preach repentance to everybody. Isaiah said, I can do this. God said, there is one caveat. Nobody's going to listen to you. Nobody's going to repent. Nobody's going to get saved. And Isaiah said, 
Isaiah said, how long? And God said, you just keep preaching. We hear the cry of Isaiah in Isaiah 53. And Isaiah cries out and says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It's a cry of desperation, frustration. Years of preaching and serving and obeying have produced no visible show you on this screen just the thousands of names, hundreds of thousands perhaps, names just scrolling. You say, Brother Wright, what are all those names? Well, those are the names of the people who have come to Christ from the words of Isaiah 53. But Isaiah cannot write Isaiah See, it cost Isaiah his life and his ministry to just be obedient to God. He wasn't saying what people wanted to hear. He wasn't popular in his day. Nobody wanted to pay attention to him at all. It was an inconvenience. seems to be working because it's producing visible results. And we think that's God's standard. God's standard is obedience. And there is no substitute for obedience to God. It is always more important to obey God rather than man. When we decide to obey God, it will often be inconvenient sometimes be costly, but it's what God requires. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray your blessing now upon the Word of God. I pray that as we think on these things, there are folks here tonight, our Father, who need to make decisions to obey you. Pastors here who need to make decisions to obey you. Folks here who need to follow your direction. I pray that you will speak to us tonight and challenge us tonight and convict us.